Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Audi. Ethnic studies on race, ethnicity, and class. Uh, we have uh, guests here who would be talking to us about this. Uh, tai Tengan, uh, chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies and associate professor of ethnic studies and anthropology. Thanks for coming. Monisha Das Gupta, uh, director of uh, South Asian Center for South Asian Studies and also Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies and Women's Studies. Thanks for coming. And uh, John Okamura, Professor of Ethnic Studies. Mahalo for coming. So what we want to do first is like uh, talk about, uh, um, maybe Tai, you can begin um, to talk about ethnic studies and um, in terms of the work of our faculty as well and its relationship to the community, ethnic studies relationship to the community and our work in relationship to the community and then we can go forward from there. Okay, great. Well, thanks for uh, having this opportunity to, to talk story about our department, which uh, was uh, established in 1970 with the focus on bringing our history our way to the University of Hawaii, which up until that point was giving a, a very different sort of uh, view of the, the history of, of Hawaii, really from the perspective of the, the dominant uh, society, sector of society. And so really um, the effort to foreground Native Hawaiian as well as the other uh, immigrant histories the, from the peoples who had come um, as laborers for the plantations and otherwise those who had uh, really worked um, the the fields um, mm -hmm. and and uh, otherwise been here prior to um, the 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 establishment of of the the state mm -hmm. of Hawaii, um, which all of these now being very contested terms mm -hmm. and um, but in the at least in the 70s um, the establishment of the department connected to those struggles on the ground. Um, including those in Kalama Valley, Waihole Waikane, Chinatown, Ota Camp, and others, which um, for anyone who's interested can read the, the chapter that you <laughs> and Daviana have, have written in the, the newly published A Nation Rising book. Um, so we, we've uh, tried to maintain those connections to the community as our understandings of the, the colonial situation mm -hmm. has also evolved. Um, it, it's no longer uh, an easy sort of claim to say it's just about local histories. Mm -hmm. There are new discourses, new critiques about settler colonialism, the, the, the role of Asian Americans as settlers, the, the questioning of how uh, we can create beneficial alliances in mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. with Native Hawaiian and other peoples of color and other communities also. Um, what it means to be now in, in a global context mm -hmm. to think about our local um, and, and how uh, those, those new forms of globalization, uh, decolonization, indigeneity are, are, are giving us also new opportunities to think about mm -hmm. new um, coalitions. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to maintain that in the work we've done with service learning, in our research, in our teaching. Um, and it's a it's a it's a great time to be thinking through these issues now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your own work in uh, connection with uh, what we have just talked sure. about? Sure. Um, my own research has been looking at the Native Hawaiian uh, movement, um, in particular the the establishment of a Hawaiian men's group within the Hawaiian mm -hmm. movement as a way of. Uh, rethinking Hawaiian masculinity in relation to Hawaiian nationalism and the the broader politics that look at these intersections of uh, gender, uh, indigeneity, as well as class. Mm -hmm. And so um, the my first work was uh, published in a book called Native Men Remade. Mm -hmm. um, and I've uh, been working on a second book looking at the experiences of Native Hawaiian veterans mm -hmm. And that um, is uh, in, in, in process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I, I see you flipping to uh, the chapter I recently right. wrote. In, right. um, in a Nation in the, Rising. So yeah. Nation Rising, a, a, a great book that's uh, recently come out, um, co-edited by Noi Lani Goodyear Kaupua, Kaika Hasi, and Aaron Kahunovai Wright. Mm -hmm. um, and so the chapter I have in there 
is uh, a portrait mm -hmm. um, uh, of the life story of Sam Kahaika'ai, um, who is a carver, storyteller, philosopher from Maui, mm -hmm. involved in, in the, the establishment of Nakoa Hawaiian mm -hmm. warrior group that was also kind of thought in terms of mm -hmm. creating a, a space for Hawaiian men to reclaim uh, uh, kuleana mm -hmm. responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, within the broader movement, mm -hmm. um, which became the Halimua, the men's house that I wrote my book about. And mm -hmm. um, Sam also himself, having served in the military, his own thoughts about warriorhood, um, mm -hmm. both drawing from our remembered pasts, uh, our deeper traditions uh, of Kanaka Oivi, warriorhood, and koa, and bravery, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also thinking through the, the place of U.S. occupation of, of Hawaii and, and what it is to be a contemporary koa and warrior mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And um, on a previous show, we also talked about your uh, book, Native uh, Men Remade, uh, and so we had a chance to discuss that as well. Uh, so, Monisha, could you um, tell us, uh, you know, about you in terms of ethnic studies and your work and how you just jumped into the community and uh, you were a natural ethnic studies from the get-go. Um, actually, my coming to Hawaii in 2002 was perhaps the best thing that happened in my intellectual and personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trained as a sociologist uh, and was basically, you know, self-educating uh, you know, I, I was self-educated in ethnic studies mm -hmm. because I studied immigrant groups and uh, the paradigms that ethnic studies uses. I had to discover by myself, you know, for example, Omi and Wainan's, you know, foundational, you know, game-changing work. Uh, all of these were not really taught to me in courses, and I just sort of found them and trained myself in them and found them very, very useful for my work. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I came to ethnic studies, uh, I felt that there was a very uh, organic link between sort of the sociological work that I was doing in terms of understanding immigrant communities, uh, the social movements that were budding in immigrant, especially in the South Asian community, and uh, you know the the an immigration policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a very organic link between you know those forms of knowledges and you know what ethnic studies had to offer. So I, you know, felt that. The kind of tensions that uh, sociology has mm -hmm. uh, weren't present in the ethnic studies department, and I could really do my work in a very, um, in a thoughtful way. And mm -hmm. I think that coming to Hawaii also you introduce these questions about indigeneity uh, occupation that I don't think I would have ever been exposed to had I done, you know, kept doing this work on the continent. And that has deeply, deeply influenced, you know, my thinking and my writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, also mm -hmm. I wanted to add that uh, um, the research you have done on uh, Mexican communities uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Hawaii um, was very well received, um, mm -hmm. you know, even uh, especially in Mexico and here in Hawaii too. Uh, but also, like we talked about it, we featured it in another mm -hmm. uh, in an earlier program. So it was uh, very helpful. Uh, to us, and I'm sure, uh, like uh, you know, that enriches uh, the curriculum itself in terms of immigration and so forth. So yeah, I, I just yeah. finished uh, two pieces based on that research, um, trying to think through, you know, what, how do we think about Mexican migration in terms of both the Pacific, uh, because that flow from the continent, the <laughs> westward flow, has been more or less ignored, um, mm -hmm. and also how do we think about the ways in which the relationships between Mexicans and other ethnic groups, especially Native Hawaiian and uh, Filipinos with whom they work in construction, mm -hmm. say, or agriculture, uh, it, you know, mm -hmm. how these relationships are structured through uh, settler colonialism mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which the r rivalries actually, you know, sort of tell us more about uh, settler colonialism than it does about, you know, sort of uh, ethnicized animosities between groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, John Okamura, you have a new book, From Race to Ethnicity, right here. So could you tell us about this and about your work and research uh, and teaching sure. ethnic studies? Well, I, I guess the book developed from uh, my teaching of the Japanese and Hawaii course since uh, 1998. And uh, when I was approached to contribute to the series on race and ethnicity in Hawaii in which uh, the book appears, I initially declined because I was working on my other book on 
ethnicity and inequality. But then thinking about it more, I, I, I realized I had my own ideas about uh, Japanese in Hawaii. And rather than uh, historical work, which uh, others have produced over the years, I, I thought I'd focus on contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. So the book combines both uh, the historical experiences and more contemporary ones up until the Yonsei generation or fourth generation of Japanese Americans uh, from the late 19th century to the present. So I have the last chap, well, the second to the last chapter is one on four Yonsei advocates or activists as I uh, represent them, uh, including Candice Fujikani from the English department, Kao Kajihiro, who's very active in the anti militarization movement here. Uh, Blake Oshiro, who wrote uh, the same-sex marriage law in Hawaii and was uh, at the forefront of having that passed when he was mm -hmm. House Majority Leader. And last is um, Norman Kaneshiro, who is, uh, I represent him as a cultural advocate for mm -hmm. traditional Okinawan music and dance. So I try to develop this argument throughout the book of the, the activism on the part of Japanese Americans, beginning with labor history and then in the Democratic Party, and then more recently with some of these Yonsei. But uh, you know, I don't make an argument that this is something that we can characterize the entire Yonsei generation mm -hmm. uh, with. That's why I focus on these individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're uh, writing another book now, right? So could yeah. you tell us something about it? I do have a chapter in the book uh, on the Maus Fukunaga mm -hmm. case of 1928. And this. Um, uh, the most yeah. recent mm -hmm. one, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I didn't use all of the research material I had and all of the ideas I had about the case. So mm -hmm. I'm working on a book manuscript now that uh, provides more detail. Uh, some, peop some people have questioned me, like, well, why are you writing about this case? You know, it's so old, 1928. Well, I'm, I'm not seeking justice for Miles Fukunaga. <laughs> I'm not trying to show that he uh, was uh, unjustly convicted and sentenced to death. I, the book is about the racial significance of, of the case in the 1920s. What does it tell us about race in Hawaii in the 1920s? Because I see the case is very much connected to the Masi Kaha mm -hmm. case three years later. Right? The individuals in the government, the judiciary, the um, attorneys, uh, they appear in the Masi Kaha case three years mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the uh, Fukunaga case to me is like a dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. you know, how can we get away with this? which they pulled off with the, more so in the Kaha Vai case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I interviewed um, uh, several of our uh, ethnic studies uh, faculty. And uh, we, we can start with uh, uh, Daviana. She's talking about her um, community engagement, primarily with the Protect uh, Kaholawe Ohana, and the significance of that since ethnic studies has been in the community as Thai. Uh, was describing earlier in this program. So we can uh, watch uh, this one. It's about a minute, uh, 10 seconds, and then we can discuss that. My primary uh, community engagement is with the uh, Protect Kaholavi Ohana. And um, through the Ohana, we're able to take ethnic city students and other students from the broader campus uh, with the College of Social Sciences uh, service learning program as well to the island of Koholabe for uh, service learning and a cultural, very deep cultural experience where students are immersed in the elements and in the, um, the culture as our ancestors of Hawaii would have experienced it on the island. And they, you know, they contribute the work, they, they engage in some protocols that are appropriate for the island and they uh, work very hard uh, this point, we're trying to open up and around the island trail uh, for our makahiki ceremonies eventually. But the around the island trail will also link uh, each ili, you know, of the island and enable us to go across the island and, and around the island to uh, better steward the resources uh, in those areas. Yeah, I mean, uh, this tells us uh, quite a bit about, uh, in fact, uh, the history of ethnic studies and uh, the history of the indigenous uh, struggle in Hawaii. Because, uh, you know, although there were like Makua before that and so on, those struggles, but the, the one that really caught attention in terms of and um, brought Hawaii, uh, I mean, brought uh, indigenous uh, struggle 
into the core of uh, Hawaii politics is the uh, Protect uh, Kahalavi Ohana uh, movement and the takeover in 76 of that island. Uh, so um, what I wanted to do uh, before we talk about it is uh, juxtapose this with, with what um, um, some of us are doing right now. Like, uh, so I interviewed uh, Rod uh, Labrador um, faculty in ethnic studies, and uh, we can um, discuss that. Uh, we can hear him talk, and then we can discuss those two together. So, part of my work is really, really trying to um, bridge the university community gap, which is a, an important principle in, in ethnic studies. Um, trying to make sure that there's this bridge between the university and the people that we are studying the people that we are living with and where we live. And so part of my work has been trying to, to make sure that the stuff that I do, the, the stuff that I teach to my students, um, is actually relevant to, to their lives wherever they're living in, in, in the islands. We worked with the Filipino American Historical Society of Hawaii, and we asked them to help us to try to get folks to submit photographs to include in the, in, um, in the book. We also did, um, we hit up social, uh, social media to try to get as much involvement from the local community to really try to create this community history and using people's uh, photographs, using historical societies' photographs, individual families, really to try to come up with a history. And it's not a comprehensive history of, of Filipinos in Hawaii, and I don't think we can really do that. But what we were trying to do was to kind of capture a I guess, a, a snapshot of what the Filipino community would look like um, through photographs. Yeah, like from PKO to <laughs> what Srod is doing now. Uh, so would you like to comment on that? Right. Sure. Um, I think Damiana's work with Protect uh, Kohola the ongoing connections with uh, students uh, here in the community to the island is, is uh, central for especially making the, the, the point that as an indigenous people, Kanaka Oe, your native Hawaiian, are, are still here, are still attending to the aina, still actively practicing aloha aina, uh, which is, is not only love of the land, as it literally translates, but it's this deep commitment and connection to, to bettering the, this place that we're at. And it really goes against the, the, the notion that Hawaiians have disappeared or culturally have assimilated or otherwise are no longer here and present. Mm -hmm. And that connects in important ways to the ways that it's through the, 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 the alliances with, with other peoples that are equally committed to making Hawaii a better place that we're, we're able mm -hmm. to create the stronger communities. And so Rod's work with the, the Filipino community and, and recapturing those histories and making them relevant today, um, both in, in, a, in, the, in the published form as well as in social media, helps to give uh, another generation a different consciousness. And it's, I think the important point is that we're connecting them in mm -hmm. our classes. They're not seen as, oh, you take the Hawaiians class and you take the Filipinos class separately. It's that the, the people within both classes are, are working together. Mm -hmm. we're, we're bringing them together in the space of our department and making them think, okay, why? Is it important for Native Hawaiians to think about these Filipino American histories and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Why is it important for them to be understanding what Aloha Aina is and mm -hmm. to actually have this chance to engage it? Um, is what we try to provide students with. Yeah, I just want to say, like uh, today is the eighth of October, and uh, the um, another group of students are leaving either tonight or tomorrow uh, for uh, Kaholawe. You know, so it's like uh, a continuing thing, yeah. Uh, Monisha, anything on that? Uh... Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Dai described it really well when he said that, you know, our classes, um, the, the material that we teach uh, connect from one class to the other, mm -hmm. and it's both uh, intersecting and also incremental. Mm -hmm. So students can go from one class uh, with, uh, with the realization why community engagement is so important to mm -hmm. our department. Uh, you know, and, and learn about lab labor struggles, and then you know connect that to uh, the, all the cultural revival as well as the taking the stewardship of land that other classes you know are teaching to our students. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is really important, and I would say that you know for me um, it's been very 
humbling in some ways uh, to be part of a process in Local 5 where I've actually seen the labor movement um, do a lot of rethinking and, you know, the mobilizing around the uh, PLDC issues, mm -hmm. for example, where on the ground they're trying to make those connections between, you know, why would a labor union be interested in issues of land development mm -hmm. and uh, Native Hawaiian dispossession. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, our, our department creates a space for students to engage with these issues and also discuss these issues because they're seeing it on TV or, you know, their friends are posting it on Facebook or there's a public hearing. Uh, so they, you know, we give them frameworks to think through those yeah. kinds of issues. Right. Before um, asking uh, John to comment on this, uh, I'd like to go to um, another uh, segment uh, with uh, Brian Chung, uh, also a faculty in ethnic studies. And um, he's talking about uh, his research uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> high tech uh, and its impact on Chinese community on the continental United States. Looking at, um, looking at the role of sort of high-tech economies and the ways that um, they shape, uh, they shape um, suburban formations, but also in the ways that they've also impacted um, Chinese-American communities within these particular suburbs. Well, I was really curious as to why um, Chinese-Americans were... Um, why Chinese-Americans were, so, were seen as so important or to high tech economies or you know why is it that when we think about silicon valley and high tech economies that we automatically um oftentimes think think about oh yeah of course it's because chinese americans it's important that chinese people help build this economy um, but you know what my research uh, hopes to contribute to is this growing body of literature that has begun to really interrogate the history of high technology um, industries in the United States as being related to U.S. empire building um, across the globe um, as well as domestically and that uh, high-tech economy is often sort of portrayed as these um, as providing job employment and um, development a lot of times are very much um, producers of racial inequalities um, spatial racial and spatial segregation um, gentrification, and so on and so forth. And so uh, my project is really trying to um, grapple with the history of the sort of high-tech economy, economy, particularly in California, and it's trying to tie that with sort of Chinese American or Chinese diasporic communities in California and how, um, in how a lot of ways Chinese diaspora and Chinese immigration has very been, much been a part of this history of U.S. Uh, empire building through high-tech economies. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we're talking about, um, earlier you mentioned globalization and so on in your introduction to what we in ethnic studies are uh, doing. So here we have like a different faculty doing different things and uh, uh, something that enriches our look at race and ethnicity, etc. cetera. Um, I want to ask uh, John about this uh, first, but before that I want to go to uh, another uh, segment with uh, Lisa Operessa, another faculty, and talking about her dissertation on American Samoa and um, U.S. American football, in fact, to show the, you know, uh, extent of our research as a faculty, as a unit uh, on campus. The dissertation um, was looking at the relationship between American Samoa and the United States and so motivated by questions about some of the changes that happened on the island over the course of the 20th century, some of the history, um, the kind of questions around political status, questions around migration and mobility to the United States, and um, looking at the expansion of American football as one of the ways to think about some of those other changes. I was doing research in the archives um, originally around the military the presence of the U.S. military in the island, World War II. And in the archives, there were a lot of different papers that I came across um, related to kind of leisure, sort of sport, um, how to keep the uh, military personnel out of the villages, and that got me asking questions about um, the presence of sport on the island and these kind of circuits of sporting movement and American sports, how they came to the U.S., or how they came to um, the territory. Um, and then, of course, my own background 
Um, my family's been very involved in the game of American football, so it kind of opened a whole new set of research questions mm -hmm. around that kind of movement and um, sporting opportunities and sporting political economy. Yeah, I mean, here, I mean, the richness of uh, the research that we have been doing in ethnic studies. So, uh, John, would you like to comment? Because I know you are very familiar with uh, these kinds of uh, issues. You mean sports? Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I think uh, Rod, uh, Brian, Lisa, and certainly uh, Monisha have added uh, this very significant um, dimension to the work we historically have done in ethnic studies, which is focused largely on Hawaii. And uh, through the coursework and the research and publications, they've um, brought this uh, much larger global perspective to what we do. And I, I think uh, the students perhaps appreciate this more so. Um, I was talking to Brian earlier just this morning uh, because I, I went to high school in the c community where he uh, did his research in Cupertino. Mm. California in uh, the heart of Silicon Valley, and uh, he was asking me about the model minority stereotype. And uh, th there's this issue in California in the spring about uh, opposition to this proposed bill that would have allowed the use of race as a criterion in college admissions in California once again. And I was talking to him about how you know, concepts like that don't necessarily apply anymore, model minority, you know, because you, you can look at the experience in California with Chinese Americans in Silicon Valley and you come up with a very different understanding of those concepts. So, and also with Rod's work, you know, you, the, the vignette we saw focused on his work in Hawaii, but he's done a lot on um, Filipino rap, which is much more so based on the continent. And so th those kinds of perspectives, I think, add quite a bit mm -hmm to uh, what we do in ethnic studies as the department. Yeah, and uh, Tai, you know, like Lisa was talking about uh, her research and then uh, the question of the military also in the Pacific, and I know like you've done some research on that, especially with the like native men, and also uh, you taught, uh, you know, uh, Hawaii and the Pacific with the focus on the military, so could you say something more about that? Yeah, sure. I think one of the other like a new frames, perhaps new um, or not, um, that also have come with some of the, the more recent faculty has been uh, this added uh, focus on the intersection of gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. So those aspects of masculinity that are foregrounded mm -hmm. in um, the, the work, looking at bodies in football and in the, the military and, and as well as in other areas that uh, Lisa's work points to. And also in the, in the context of empire, which has become another important frame for us to think mm -hmm. and expand our thinking with. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the, the work that she does, that, that Monisha does, um, that I've, I've done as well, trying to make these intersections explicit, um, when, whether it's in, in football or whether it's in labor organizing or whether it's in cultural revitalization, how, how gender kind of comes to the fore in important mm -hmm. ways in thinking about what it is to create new identities and, and subjectivities. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's been uh, an important frame for thinking. I think the Hawaii Pacific connection is, is also important in foregrounding. Um, sometimes when we're thinking about uh, Hawaii, we don't always think about its position in the Pacific mm -hmm. and in its relation with other Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that we've really tried to, to change and highlighting, especially in recent years, the, the situation of Micronesians mm -hmm. in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, who have become the, the latest uh, group to suffer the, the uh, the most severe forms of overt, blatant um, discrimination mm -hmm. and, and racism. And um, in a lot of ways, this departs from our, our, our deeper cultural histories where we are all of Oceania, where we have these longer genealogies that connect us. Um, and we sometimes need to remind our, our Hawaiian community the most because some of the, the worst sorts of racist comments and discrimination comes internally from, from our own uh, Native Hawaiian community. And this reflects, uh, I think, a, a response to 
being uh, indigenous and marginalized within your own home and seeing yet another community mm -hmm. coming, viewing them, I think, wrongly as, as another one who's coming to take. And, and I think we need to kind of shift mm -hmm. the discussion. And that's what we've been trying to do with, with a number mm -hmm. of um, our symposium that we've had mm -hmm. in the past we, with uh, Ula Hassager and uh, in particular working with uh, our local Micronesian community. Mm -hmm. We've organized um, uh, Micronesian Connections, Oceanic Connections mm -hmm. Symposium, partnering with the Center for Pacific Island Studies as well to help try to open up that discussion. Mm -hmm. And also what we seek to do, again, when looking towards next year, we have our uh, conference, Our Future, Our Way, uh, directions in oceanic in ethnic March, studies right? in March. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah thanks for this. Uh, it's uh, very good. So um, this actually requires, uh, you know, a program all by itself, and uh, I think we should do that. Uh, but uh, I was going to say, like we have been doing, uh, as you mentioned, things along those lines to improve um, or better our knowledge about these things and our consciousness about what's happening really. Uh, to Micronesians here and then Micronesia as well. Uh, so, um, okay, we have done all these uh, uh, kinds of uh, discussion to show um, the, um, you know, uh, richness of uh, the research that uh, we have been doing. So I asked uh, Daviana, um, you know, okay, about um, ethnic studies and, uh, you know, uh, given all that we have discussed, uh, just to show, to uh, see, or and appreciate her um, idea about ethnic studies and what it does. So we will watch that. Well, ethnic studies have started to uh, tell the history of our people um, from our perspective. And, uh, you know, prior to that, people didn't really know there was, it had been an overthrow and that annexation was not legal and, uh, didn't really understand the uh, contributions that all the different various ethnic groups have made to Hawaii's economy and politics and uh, social development. So uh, ethnic studies is an important base for uh, uh, documenting the history of our people in Hawaii and um, developing toward a, a positive role in the future of Hawaiians and of Hawaii and realizing that our students are going to be the next generation of leaders and they should be aware of not just the um, social issues but the political economic issues and how it's how what is the role that race and ethnicity and class plays uh, in in shaping our future. Mm -hmm. I believe we should have a master's program so that our, we can then take students to another level of analysis and, and research and, and experience uh, as masters because at that level then uh, the students have a, a basic grasp of what the, you know, the, the concepts and the, uh, the trends and, and they can begin to uh, elevate that analysis and develop it to make contribution back to the community. Yeah, and then um, what I want to do is also go to Brian's uh, segment because uh, it's interesting, like he's talking about how he came, uh, you know, to ethnic studies. And it's not like how he came to ethnic studies in Hawaii, but to the field of ethnic studies. So it's interesting, like his development, uh, intellectual development along those lines. Yeah, so I came to ethnic studies in college. Um, I took a African American literature class, mm -hmm. and I had a really wonderful professor by the name of uh, Dr. Daphne Brooks. And um, you know, I think one of the things that was really exciting for me, as far as um, what ethnic studies offered for me as an undergraduate student, was that it helped answer a lot of questions that I had about growing up in an immigrant community. Um, and it helped me sort of understand sort of the experiences of sort of racism and discrimination and pr racial prejudice that my uh, parents had experienced growing up. And it gave me a vocabulary to begin to understand the world around me as it was sort of unfolding as a child as well as in college. And so, you know, I think for me what was really great about ethnic studies was that it, it allowed me to sort of understand the world around me and to get a sort of conceptual framework to understand it. 
Um, but it also really sort of excited, what excited me as well was that it was very much about the ways that social movements and um, communities were developing new ideas and new sort of possibilities to change the worlds around them, whether it's through literature or popular culture or through policy. Yeah, so um, Monisha, would you like to uh, comment on that? Because of, uh, also you came to ethnic studies uh, in a different way as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that uh, the vision that uh, Deviana outlined with, um, you know, us putting uh, the stories, experiences, histories of marginalized groups at the center of what we do in terms of research and teaching is foundational to ethnic studies. Uh, but at the same time, I think that, um, you know, the eth ethnic studies has given us tools to uh, think about, you know, uh, the work that John does that, uh, you know, sort of pushes back against the black-white paradigm that we use mm -hmm. on, black-white race, race paradigm that we use on the continent to say that all ethnic groups are not equally oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to uh, look at, you know, groups of color and how they interrelate. So I think mm -hmm. that uh, we, we are able to ask very complicated questions about uh, the ways in which different ethnic groups are relating to each other, Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. you know, relating to Micronesians, Mexicans relating to Native Hawaiians and Micronesians. Um, and, you know, for the purpose of uh, building coalitions. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the, Brian talked about, you know, sort of um, us both getting a vocabulary to explain the world mm -hmm. through ethnic studies, but also developing a vocabulary in order to explain what's going on now um, mm -hmm. in terms of you know, uh, relationships that get easily collapsed within uh, paradigms that don't deal with indigeneity, for example, or mm -hmm. don't articulate the role of U.S. empire, both domestically and uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're really thinking about those issues and um, trying to figure out how to frame them best. Yeah, good. Um, before we have more discussion, I want to go to uh, Lisa, another segment of Lisa, because she's telling us about um, the classes she's teaching. And then I want to go after that to Rod, uh, because he talks about also uh, ES, so we can figure out how different uh, faculty members from ethnic studies looking at ethnic studies and the courses they teach. So we'll go to Lisa now. I'm teaching sociology of sport for sociology department. Um, I also teach immigration to Hawaii in the U.S. and racism and ethnicity in Hawaii uh, for ethnic studies, and then one of them is also for sociology. So in those three courses, you know, those three take different strands of the research that I've done in the past. One looking at questions around immigration, and so we do a lot of different um, things, including both contemporary policies and different histories of immigration to Hawaii and to the U.S., uh, continental U.S. Um, for the racism and ethnicity in Hawaii class, that's um, been one that's really been helpful to think about the dimensions of ideas about race and ideas about culture um, for a lot of different groups here in Hawaii, but in my own work for thinking about Samoans mm -hmm. and sort of um, their place here in Hawaii, their place in the continental U.S., uh, what are the kinds of stereotypes, um, how do they get talked about in the media. So we use media, we use history. Um, right now we have a closed Facebook page for our class, so we're doing a lot of different things there. Yeah, so here, um, you know, it gives us an idea about some of the courses, uh, uh, especially the ones uh, she's teaching and some of the ones she's uh, teaching, like uh, other people also in the department uh, teach some of them. So um, we can uh, go to Rod's uh, segment now and talk about uh, how he um, looks at uh, ethnic studies and then we can discuss. I think the questions that we're asking in ethnic studies are really important. Um, I think ethnic studies can serve as a frame for looking at broader, uh, broader regional issues that we're talking about. Um, but also, I think even more basic questions like, how do we build community? How do we address issues or how do we address the, the legacies of, of colonialism? Whether we're talking about here in Hawaii or talking about the Philippines or talking about the rest of Oceania. Right. How do we address those kinds of questions? And I think ethnic studies can provide frameworks for addressing these issues, whether we're talking about building solidarities across um, racial lines or building solidarities across indigeneities. Right. Um, 
ethnic studies can provide frames for, for being able to address those things. Yeah, actually, the book that you see that lying on the edge of the table, <laughs> that's his first book about, uh, you know, pictorial uh, um, storytelling about uh, the um, Filipino community in Hawaii. But Tai, uh, could you say uh, more about uh, what we have heard so far? Sure. I think that one of the, just taking off of that last point that Rod was making on coalition building, um, one of the ways that we actually put that into practice is to have our students try to apply what they're learning in class to actual situations. Um, much of that has come through the uh, establishment of the Ethnic Studies Student Association, which mm -hmm. Rod helped to uh, found as a founding advisor. But really, a, a number of different uh, students that were looking to apply the knowledge in, in their actual lives and struggles in the communities. And so um, they've done a number of really important um, interventions here at the university. Um, one um, that Monisha was also actively mm -hmm. involved in was to get in-state tuition for undocumented students. Um, and we had a, a major who was um, at the lead of that um, effort, mm -hmm. um, which was successful. I mean, it actually created a change in policy um, for these, uh, again, these are students whose uh, who status as undocumented um, leads them to have to, before it led them to have to pay um, out-of-state tuition mm -hmm. even though they grew up and went to mm -hmm. high school here. So mm -hmm. that was a policy change that was mm -hmm. made. Um, they've also recently been involved to have a similar um, policy change made for Pacific Islander mm -hmm. students who at one point were paying in-state tuition and then there was a change in, um, in, the, in the past, that, in the more recent past that made them pay, uh, was it 150% tuition? Mm -hmm. And so they're looking mm -hmm. to get that um, again changed, especially for students who don't have colleges in their own Pacific mm -hmm. Island nations. Um, and as well as creating social spaces for mm -hmm. the students to connect and, and mm -hmm. think and talk about these issues in their lives. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I think, really where you see all of these, um, what, what's happening in the classroom be put into practice. Mm -hmm. And in and, and, and ways that are, you know, we just let them go with yeah, it and yeah. we, we uh, take, <laughs> take the lead, let yeah. them take the lead on it. Yeah, in fact, we had like, what is it, uh, about two weeks ago, an open house and it was uh, very interesting. And ESA Students Association helped with that, etc. So before uh, we have more discussion, um, I asked Daviana about uh, you know what uh, she's doing um, uh, and uh, in terms of um, Hawaiian native issues and so forth. So we'll listen to that. Well, the other project that I've been working on the last um, three years has been to document the history and the evolution of Native Hawaiian governance in Hawaii to uh, prove the um, Native Hawaiians uh, have established a government-to-government -government relationship with the U.S. government, which should be reestablished. So I've um, worked with uh, Melody McKenzie, uh, who is at the law school, and we have uh, written a, a new book what we will be published as a book um, eventually, uh, which uh, again shows a genealogy of Native Hawaiian governance in the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah, and this is like important work uh, also, but um, I want to also uh, talk about that uh, in conjunction with uh, what uh, Rod is uh, doing now because uh, I mean, his next book is coming out uh, soon, and then we can have like discussion about that because I know also, uh, at, at least uh, Ty and John know about that book, and uh, I'm sure you also do. So we can have discussion about uh, both uh, Davianas and Rods. Um, so the next book that's coming out is called Building Filipino Hawaii. Um, and it's actually based off of uh, research that I had conducted as part of my dissertation when I was at UCLA. Um, but then also uh, more research that I incorporated since um, since I was working at Gear Up and also since I started working here. And the basic idea with that is I, I really wanted to start off with a, a pretty simple question. What does it mean to be Filipino in Hawaii? Right? And then really try to address how have people tried to answer that basic question? You know, how have youth tried to answer that question? 
How have politicians, how has the Filipino Community Center answered that question? How have local comedians answered that question? And really kind of looking at, well, looking at uh, the way that people have answered these questions, what are the, the, the consequences of the ways that they've defined what it means to be Filipino in Hawaii? How does that shape their politics? How does that shape their, their understanding of, of who they are, of understanding their place here in, in Hawaii? And so with that book, the, the idea with that is really to kind of try to begin to answer the question, what does it mean to be Filipino in Hawaii? And also, again, really try to um, figure out, well, in our answering that question, what does that mean in terms of our, our broader politics? Uh, so, uh, Ty, would you like to comment uh, first, like on Daviana and maybe also on Rod? Um, since uh, she's talking about uh, indigenous Hawaiian issues. Sure. Um, really, the, 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 the question of Hawaiian nationhood and its uh, relations with U.S. Um, empire are, are now in the news daily. Right? Mm -hmm. um, recently, over the, over the summer, there were hearings held when the representatives from the Department of Interior were posing the question in the Hawaiian community as well as in the Hawaiian diaspora on the continent if a Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian government um, should be established and if the Department of Interior should have a role in that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at one point, or I think earlier in the, in the Native Hawaiian movement, if we're going to place it from the 1970s coming onward with the first claims for restoring government and recognition and so forth were being articulated. In earlier years, I think that would have been a resounding yes. You know, mm -hmm. the U.S. needs to be accountable and then mm -hmm. set up a, a nation within uh, the framework of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. But as a lot of the research has evolved and, and new critiques have developed, there's been a stronger claim for um, independence, for really refusing to be under the U.S. as its ward and to be seen as an equal, as, as a, as had been the case when Hawaii was recognized by the first by the family of nations in 1843 and, and broadly internationally up until 1893, um, new arguments saying that you know the Hawaiian kingdom still exists, and so understanding these these various claims and and how they emerge is, is really important and critical research that Daviana is, is involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are the, what's the place for other? peoples that are mm -hmm. not Native Hawaiian within this Hawaiian nation. And so the, the kinds of questions that Rod is posing, about mm -hmm. what does it mean to be Filipino? Mm -hmm. um, or that Lisa is posing as being Samoan or other, what are the place of other peoples within a mm -hmm. emergent Hawaiian mm -hmm. nation? Uh, mm -hmm. Or perhaps when it's just still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Uh, John, would you like to comment on? Well, Rod's uh, question, what does it mean to be Filipino, isn't really uh, just an existential question has real significance for them, uh, particularly since the 70s with the um, arrival of post-65 immigrants. That, that, that question became much more uh, extremely troubling because there were these uh, violent conflicts between local and immigrant Filipinos. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in 74 where young kids are literally killing each other at McKinley High School and Waipahu Intermediate. So it, while some people might think you know, it's, it's a kind of uh, open-ended question, the issues he addresses in his book, like uh, the ethnic joke telling about Filipinos, which unfortunately has really been passed on to Micronesians now, as uh, time uh, alluded to previously, you know, some of the, the most vile jokes you can, you, can, you can hear now have to do with Micronesians. I mean, I, I, I've looked at a lot of Filipino jokes over the decades, and these Micronesian jokes are far worse mm -hmm. in terms of the content and how they represent Micronesians. But going back to Rod's work, or, or the, the Phil Comp Center, it's, it's not just putting up a building there in Waipahu for the community. It says something about the Filipino community at this point in its history, uh, because they always put it in the context of the uh, they're coming after Chinese and Japanese uh, in, in terms of the plantation experience and moving off the plantation. Uh, so these are some of the uh, real significant questions like Ty mentioned about uh, the book that and research that Davy is doing or Manisha's research on 
Latino immigrants to Hawaii. I think what we contribute in ethnic studies is really addressing these ongoing problems mm -hmm. and issues in the community and, and offering perspectives uh, to our students about um, trying to understand these issues also from an ethnic studies perspective and, and not from a kind of popular culture mm -hmm. point of view that reinforces stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So uh, what I want to do is uh, go to a segment with Brian and uh, then we go from there. The two main courses that I teach is the Chinese in Hawaii course as well as the Asian American survey course. And uh, next semester I'll be teaching um, a course that I created with Dr. Labrador as well as uh, Dr. Lisa Uparesa, which is on a uh, special topics course in ethnic studies around race and popular culture. Um, and, you know, the ways I sort of approach my courses is, uh, is um, the ways that I think some of my mentors as undergrads as well as, grad as, as, well as in graduate school um, used, which was through the lens of popular culture, um, because that's uh, popular culture and social media, I think, are ways that sort of young people, um, you know, process information or get information or, you know, stuff on the internet as well. And so one of the things that I try to do in some of my classes is to, you know, look at popular representation, whether it's film, um, TV, uh, you know, YouTube, um, you know, websites, popular websites, as sort of an entry point to begin to talk about other, its relationship to issues of political economy, um, political power, you know, economics, colonialism, and racism. Yeah, so uh, we can see like, uh, you know, the courses we teach, uh, the research we do, and uh, the broad uh, scope of that research, um, you know, interrelate with one another. And so um, I want to go to um, a segment with Lisa. She's talking about her research and the new book that uh, she's working on. The research that I've been doing has been um, basically working from the dissertation and moving it into a book project. And the book project is a little bit more focused on the sport migration aspect of the story. Um, so talking a little bit about the kind of political economy of football, um, what does it take for uh, some of the players to transform themselves into um, valuable players from the kind of coach's perspective. Mm -hmm. How do they move from high school to college to the professional ranks? So part of it is um, a story about economics, but also about the social aspects of this movement. How does it connect to um, the earlier generations that came and settled a lot of the Samoan communities in Hawaii and the continental US? So some of it's about um, the community history and I'm working on a new chapter on, two new chapters actually, one on media representations of Samoans and Pacific Islanders in sport. Um, and then the second one on questions around injury and risk. So that relates to the new research on concussions, head injury, um, and that kind of, a lot of the high profile uh, debates and discussions around that. So the new publication we have is actually the new volume of the Contemporary Pacific and it's on global sport in the Pacific. And so I have a chapter in there, an article in there, and then there are several others from different parts of the Pacific talking about um, global sport. So mostly focused on rugby, on um, uh, soccer, and on American football. So Manisha, like football uh, or sports is not all uh, fame and glory. <laughs> it has to do with race and migration and all of that. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, you know, just building off of what Ty, uh, John, and the people uh, that we, you know, heard excerpts uh, from, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, one of the things that I've learned in coming to ethnic studies is that we, you know, my colleagues are really public intellectuals because, you know, they really bring their research uh, to the community in very accessible and effective ways. So, you know, just thinking about Ty's work, um, he goes to the legislature to testify on various issues, you know, whether it is water rights, uh, whether it is land use, um, land rights, uh, whether it is, you know, taking care of, um, of uh, remains, the proper care of remains and what museum people call cultural artifacts. Uh, you know, John testifying for, uh, you know, uh, to, to keep Micronesian, uh, uh, the tuition 
uh, rates for Pacific Islander students who come here for education. Uh, the same, you know, the in-state levels, um, you know, my going to the legislature and testifying on Mexicans in Hawaii uh, to alleviate some of the challenges that they face. Uh, you know, Deviana's, you know, constant work in the community, uh, your work with the uh, American Civil uh, Liberties Union. I think that we, you know, we really make our analyses and research available to the community, and we see that as a very uh, fundamental role that we play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I want to remind uh, all of us uh, about, you know, the importance of ethnic studies. Uh, and, and, and by way of summation, I want to go to Brian's uh, segment, and uh, he talks about that. Yeah. You know, I think ethnic studies is very crucial to the moment, to the particular political, um, social, and cultural climate that we live in. Um, you know, I think with a lot of the sort of issues that are happening around us, um, you know, I think ethnic studies has a strong role to play in not just reflecting on what these issues are in our society, but providing tangible um, and new ways of thinking about these issues and maybe providing solutions for how we discuss these issues. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's been really wonderful about ethnic studies is that it's about, uh, at least in my experience, is that it's very much about developing and building community power um, and how these, this form of community power can provide new alternatives to how we want to live in society. Um, not necessarily just about reforming society, but actually creating something entirely new. And I think that um, ethnic studies, to me, has always been that place where we can continue to dream and think of new possibilities um, that could help us deal with the issues around us. Yeah, this kind of uh, like uh, pedagogy, um allows the students uh, to be uh, you know to have ownership of their own education etc and give them the space uh, to do so so any um, we have another minute or so so any final comments uh, Ty? um i guess the only thing i would point out that has been a little bit underplayed is the role of class mm -hmm. that um when there is this allusion to political economy and the role that um capitalist formations play in in structuring reality in, in ways that sometimes we feel very limited by. Mm -hmm. um, one of the the uh, promises I think that Brian was pointing out in imagining other alternatives based in um, solidarities that sometimes get erased with the class differences mm -hmm. is, is that that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, addressing the material constraints and, and pressures, but also how, how can we get around mm -hmm. that and, and really challenge these structures in important ways. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some of us also, like, uh, innovate in uh, our uh, teaching. Uh, for instance, Rod and Brian use hip-hop and so on to, uh, to uh, focus on class and, uh, you know, discrimination and so forth. So, Monisha, uh, any quick uh, thing? I just want to say that, you know, the turn to popular culture uh, in our department is very, very important. And I think Ty opened up the way and then, uh, you know, that gave... Uh, that made a space, I think, mm -hmm. for us to seriously think about these cultural mm -hmm. formations, with, you know, in the context of yeah. racial and indigenous yeah. inequalities. Yeah, we have a few seconds. Uh, John, any quick things? Well, we've been ignoring your own activism and advocacy. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> for uh, Palestinian issues, so if we had more time, we could have uh, yeah, yeah. had you talk about some of the work you've been doing the past, uh, well, not just the past year, but uh, well, when you were on sabbatical, but over the course of uh, the past several decades on behalf of uh, the Palestinian people. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we're flat out of time. And uh, mahalo nui loa, and see you next month. Aloha. Aloha.